Good morning. My name is Tierna Doherty, and I am the Chief of Conservation for the Lunder Conservation Center. We, thanks to an endowment started by Mr. and Mrs. Lunder, are able to offer programs to both professional and public audiences. Uh, it's been a great pleasure of mine to work with colleagues here in both museums in generating ideas for these programs and making them available through often YouTube and our website uh, to much larger audiences. We are delighted to see so many people interested in this program, and we have to give credit to Hugh Shockey for the idea, and not just the seeds for the topic, but all of the speakers on the program were recommended by Hugh, who made initial contact. Following Hugh's lead, Chris Weiner, program coordinator who recently left for a position at the Baltimore Museum of Art, did an exemplary job, as always, in pulling this program together. Some of you will have been able to sign up for demonstrations tomorrow of CO2. We have two groups meeting here and meeting at the Hirshhorn and swapping to see applications on sculpture both inside and outside the museum. And we've had long wait lists for those programs. And so we're sorry we can't accommodate everyone, uh, but we are glad that you're able to join us here today. The program is being video recorded. Our speakers have all agreed to that. And after editing, you'll probably see videos go up online, hopefully by the end of the year. The American art team here is quite busy because we have another art museum that we look after called the Renwick Gallery over by the White House. And it's undergoing renovations and will reopen in mid-November with site-specific installations by artists like Maya Lin and Leo Villarreal. So we're very excited about that event and have a lot of, as you can imagine, sort of videos and photography to do ahead of uh, updating our YouTube videos. My introduction to this topic came, of course, through Hugh mentioning it when he worked here at the American Art Museum. And then I read the article in 2009 that he did for the AIC, where he talked about the treatment of this Robert Morris sculpture. And I've subsequently looked and noticed that there have been a number of articles since, mostly on objects and textile conservation. And I'm glad that today we do have a variety of conservators represented here to talk about this treatment application. It's been my impression that I think some people think of it as an innovative tool that may just have some very specific applications, but I think more and more people realize that, as Hugh has described, in ways it can be used as a sort of maintenance tool for collections and collection care and cleaning. So I'm really excited that we will have a range of presentations today talking about the wide applicability of CO2 snow, CO2 pellets, and lastly, I just want to mention, excuse, sorry, the formatting here, oh my. Um, we have a flyer upstairs, I'll go back. The flyer looks like this, it has some little beakers on it. Um, we have a big program in November that we're very excited about, a two-day program, November 19th and 20th, titled Conservation and Exhibition Planning, Material Testing for Design, Display, and Packing. And I'll tell you, as mostly objects conservators, that being a paintings conservator, when I came here to work, I worked along with Hugh and Helen in objects conservation and learned a lot about Audi testing. Uh, as a paintings conservator, I was able to sort of blissfully ignore it for a long time. Um, and I soon realized that it's complicated. And so we've pulled together a great program over two days to talk about not just Audi testing, but material testing in general. Um, really the subtext there being alternatives to the Audi test. So that's the main focus of that program, and I hope you'll pick up flyers upstairs. It's a collaboration with the FAIC, so registration for that program will be through the AIC website. I would like to thank, in addition to Hugh and Chris, Abigail Chaudhry from the FAIC, who you've seen here this morning. She's helped a lot organizing our speakers' presentations. I'd also like to thank all of the American Art Conservation team, staff, and volunteers, and interns for helping with organizing this program. With no further ado, we will introduce our first speaker. Robert Sherman obtained a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Cooper Union in New York City. Later, he obtained an MS and PhD in Metallurgy from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He was engaged in research and development from 1982 to 1991, where his focus involved surface analysis, surface treatments, thin films, 
and surface cleanliness as applied to a wide range of materials and processes. He has published over 45 papers and has two US patents. A major portion of this work involved performing surface analysis studies on numerous types of materials, establishing the effectiveness and then developing applications for CO2 snow cleaning and establishing methods for preparing and cleaning stainless steels for the high purity gas industry. He also has experience in failure analysis and arson investigations. His interest in CO2 snow cleaning led him to form Applied Surface Technologies in 1991. He is also active in the local New York, New Jersey chapter of the American Society for Materials, where he has been chair twice and treasurer. Please join me in welcoming Robert. Uh, first, I would like to thank the American uh, Art Museum for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here talking about carbon dioxide snow cleaning. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay, CO2 snow cleaning is basically a very simple technique. Its unique abilities are particle removal of all sizes. We see particle removal from what's visible dust down to three to five nanometers, 30 angstroms, roughly 10 atoms across. At the same time, you can remove hydrocarbon stains like fingerprints, facial grease, organic residues. And so it's a very simple, straightforward technique. And just to give you a little background, the first known publication on CO2 snow cleaning was done by Professor Stuart Honing out of our University of Arizona in Tucson in 1986. And he went around the country giving talks to show that this is a potential way of replacing Freon, which was a very hot topic in the mid-1980s. So 1988 onward, onward, there's many others, including me. But it's uh, essentially what was he's doing as a demonstration of uh, university-based equipment has become a uh, an accepted technique for cleaning many different types of surfaces. So as I said, a CO2 snow cleaning is simple. There's no chemical waste unless what you're cleaning is a dangerous compound. So at the end of the day, there's nothing to send to hazardous waste. It's simple. It's essentially safe. The only two concerns are don't spray yourself and make sure you're doing it in a room that has good ventilation or have a CO2 meter. It's environmentally acceptable in that we're not adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because the carbon dioxide you're using already has been generated by a power plant or a food fermentation site. So it's delayed release. And it's scratch free. It's a very simple process. Uh, is there a laser pointer working? There. <laughs> there is a Cylinder, carbon dioxide over here. Usu okay, carbon dioxide cylinder always has liquid CO2 in it. And you can take it out as a liquid or as a gas. And there's advantages of each method. So there's a carbon dioxide cylinder. There's a valve which isn't listed someplace there. A nozzle, and there's your sample. It's an extremely simple setup. And of course, as usual, de the de devil's in the details. So how does CO2 snow cleaning work? Uh, and how is it formed? When you start with a carbon dioxide, whoops, carbon dioxide cylinder, you're starting roughly at 800 PSI at room temperature below the critical point. Uh, so you're on that line between the vapor and the liquid. At the end of the day, you're at 14.7 PSI at room temperature. How you get there forming dry ice is not clear from the phase diagram. This is an equilibrium phase diagram, and this is not an equilibrium process. So to gain a better understanding, we go to a little chemistry. Pressure enthalpy diagram. So for those not familiar with enthalpy, it's kind of like entropy, energy, but it's essentially a measurement of a quantity of interest to chemists. There's two points of interest on this. If you're taking liquid CO2 in the cylinder, and you pass it through a nozzle, what was a line on the previous diagram becomes a two-phase region of mixed vapor and liquid. 
essentially with liquid, we're boiling the liquid, generating gas bubbles in the, the nozzle. As the pressure falls, it, as the pressure falls in the two-phase region, you hit what I call the magic number, 78 PSI. And whatever liquid was left in the nozzle becomes a solid phase. So as the pressure drops, you're forming a solid. And then that solid is accelerated to the surface where it hits the surface. With a CO2 gas feed, if you have a, what's called an adiabatic nozzle, you go down the same straight line, if it's an adiabatic type nozzle, which is a constant enthalpy expansion, and you hit the magic number 78 PSI, you get about 6% CO2 snow as compared to about 42% when you use liquid CO2 feed. So you have a solid phase hitting the surface, and when that happens, pressure increases. As the pressure increases enough, you exceed the 78 PSI again, and you form the liquid phase. Liquid CO2 is an excellent solvent for hydrocarbons. So you're essentially doing a solvent cleaning on the surface as you're physically knocking the particles off. Now, some people like to say it goes through the process goes through the triple point. Well, in this diagram, the triple point has become a triple point line, which is a rather confusing concept. So let's go. So this is essentially the basic chemistry or physics behind the process, this diagram. So how does it clean? Generally, when you blow nitrogen or compressed air on the surface, you get a flowing gas, what's called the aerodynamic drag force. That works down to particles in the micron range, thousandths of an inch, barely visible sized particles. What the CO2 snow does, it introduces momentum transfer, like playing pool. You're literally striking the particle on the surface and knocking it off the surface. And this works what's called weakly bound particles. So that's the particle removal mechanism. Hydrocarbons, referring to the previous slide, it's solvency. Liquid CO2 is an excellent solvent. Unfortunately, it does not exist at atmospheric pressure. Organics, let's say like a, a silicone oil, very thin layer of silicone oil, that's not soluble in liquid CO2. The cleaning mechanism is slower. It's really it's called freeze fracture. We're freezing that layer and banging it off. So it's a slow process. What goes on here, if you people use solvents and you clean, a, let's say, a glass surface, you get a stain in the corner, this process can remove that solvent stain. So I want to talk about the basic rules of surface cleaning. From a surface science viewpoint, it removes what's physically adsorbed. By physically adsorbed, we're talking about things bound by Van der Waals forces, electrostatic, capillary forces, essentially weak never chemically adsorbed species. By that, it's covalent bound, ionic, metallic bonding. They stay. This implies that essentially the, a material should not be abraded. And there's only one or two materials that can be abraded because of their essentially structure. But that's lim it's extremely limited. Practically, loose bound contamination can be removed. Not glue, taint, tape, paint, globs of gunk. And the last rule is, of course, rules are meant to be broken because CO2 snow cleaning has been used to remove paint, which is, of course, not expected. It's been used to remove solder flux, flux not expected, because that's a polymeric material well bound to the surface. So I view the rule, last rule as the most important rule, try things out. So there's two modes of CO2 snow cleaning. And I think the next two speakers are going to be talking about the high velocity mode, where we're going back to that pressure enthalpy diagram. We're taking a very, we're using an 80 back type of nozzle, getting a pressure drop, and producing a stream of high velocity, very small dry ice. Uh, the size of the dry ice is on the R of 10 to 100 microns. Uh, and it goes for about three, four inches, maybe up to five inches, depending upon the feed and other factors. Then there's the low velocity mode, which is what Stuart Honing first worked on. Here, you're doing a non adiabatic expansion, producing larger CO2 snowflakes. That's why it's called snow cleaning. It's actually, you just pile it up on the floor, and we'll demonstrate that tomorrow. It's a lower velocity, but it could cover a much larger area. 
It takes off loosely bound particles, it will never take off organics. So we have two modes of operation. And then in my background, the applications, the semiconductor field loves this for removing particles because particles are death on a, on a wafer. And they don't use it on pattern wafers as much as they use it in what's called the back end of foundry operations. They use it in photo mask repair units, all over the cleaning of equipment, cleaning of tooling. The disk drive industry uses CO2 snow cleaning supposedly in over two dozen different manufacturing steps, from the media to the heads to every component in the disk drive almost, except for the circuitry. Optics is another major area in surface cleaning for CO2 snow. And just to give you an idea of the size, we're cleaning fiber optic connectors, which are those very small things, up to eight meter telescopes using different methods. And there's actually talk now of that 30 meter telescopes ever built of using CO2 snow on that. So in terms of optics, lenses, mirrors, gratings, and I think our next speaker cleaned some art, glass artwork once. Uh, many different types of metals, ceramics, polymers, glasses of all kind. Uh, if the surface can be held, can be supported, and kept warm, we probably have tried it. An uh, area of very many applications is cleaning thin film substrates before thin film depositions. I mean, if you have like a two inch by two inch piece of glass and you want to put a coating on it, you want to clean that substrate. And in R&D and test applications, CO2 snow cleaning is used a lot. But when pr people produce thousands of coated glasses a day, they're not using CO2, they're using ultrasonics. General laboratory production, clean room cleaning, then the area I was involved with heavily back in the 80s was sample preparation before surface analysis. Those methods, OJ, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and SIMS, they're used to analyze the first 10 or so atomic layers of a surface. So cleanliness is critical. And that's where I got my first uh, experience in CO2 snow cleaning, and we published showing it was effective at that scale. Then the last one, AFM, atomic force microscopy, and we'll show a good example of that later. Solvent stain removal can be done, and some people have used that for vacuum systems and other large metal parts reworking. Then the last thing, which I think this audience knows far more than I do, is art and artifact restoration, and I'll mention that later on. So I'm gonna give some nice, simple examples. This one is, is a silicon wafer that I scratched, and scratches on the right, and we not only did we crack the surface, we also generate lots of particles. This is an optical micrograph at 1,000x, and after cleaning the exact same areas, there's nothing. This is a typical result you expect with CO2 snow cleaning. Then hydrocarbon removal. This is, there's a crack on a silicon wafer, a scratch, that's uh, the top, Micrograph is what my facial grease looks like at a thousand X. Not very good. But essentially, we cleaned it. And not only did we image it, we also performed on surfaces what's called XPS to show that not only did we remove all the stain, but we removed some of the background hydrocarbons also. So these basic samples show a lot. And then stain removal. This is a three inch silicon wafer with some artwork on it. It's a Sharpie pen. You guys know Sharpies very well. And when someone takes a Sharpie to an artwork, that's a problem to take off. And after cleaning, except for my fingerprint stains, which are there, we took them off. This requires more effort and attention for cleaning, but it can be done in, in many types of materials. A soft plastic, this might be impossible. But uh, glass, it can be done. And actually using a Sharpie pen on glass surfaces is a common tool in thin film uh, coatings. It's a way of getting, you remove the Sharpie afterwards, you get a step height if it was coated. Now, AFM, this is a wonderful example. Atomic force microscopy. Uh, it's an analytical technique that gives surface structure. And the way it works is like a record player. You take a needle, and run it over the surface. And as the cantilever bends up and down, it generates a voltage. And that voltage can be 
correlated to the up and down movement. So it's been worked out so you can actually image on good days individual atoms. And there's actually an example out there where IBM had individual atoms spelling out IBM and they imaged it. It's a very powerful technique. So this sample is what's called a step height standard. The dark areas are deep, the brighter areas are the surface. And that height is set by NIST in Gaithersburg. They make the standard, everyone reproduces it. This was a very heavily contaminated sample ready for the garbage. The image on the left is step height, up and down distance. Left and right distances are not accurate in this measurement, but up and down are. The image on the upper right is what's called phase. It's kind of related to the composition or density. After cleaning, it's as good as new, and we spent the rest of the time proving that the step height did not change. And with these images, we were able to prove that cleaning for an unknown, probably organic, of some kind that was not cleaned in spice solvents, we saw particles as small as three to five nanometers be taken off. And that kind of sets the lower limit for CO2 snow cleaning. So it, all this sounds wonderful, but with any cleaning process, there's always issues. Whenever someone tries to sell you on a cleaning process, ask them what could go wrong or what's the necessary or what's the issues. Sample support is needed. It's a high velocity gas flow. So if you can't support it and it doesn't weigh a lot, it's going to be going someplace else. You'll blow it away. <laughs> Believe me, it has happened. Uh, the most critical, difficult issue is what's called sample cooling. We're dealing with dry ice. It's cold. So as soon as a cold substance hits a surface, that surface cools. You're going to get moisture condensation if you're in open air, especially on a day like today where it's so humid. So there's ways of getting around this problem. Generally for glass and silicon wafers and metals, you just heat it a little up to like 30 to 40 centigrade, that's enough. You keep the thermal input while cleaning, it works. But on polymers, it gets to be a little trickier because there's no thermal conductivity in polymers. So you go use blanketing gases. You take a dry gas such as nitrogen or dry compressed air, try to surround the CO2 snow stream, and it does work, and our next speaker is going to give some great examples of that. He worked it out very well. Another way of getting around this problem, dry boxes, dry environments, essentially having a mini environment where the moisture is low. Generally, I think for this audience, you get away with maybe 1% relative humidity for cleaning a polymer object, but in the semiconductor industry, they need it down to parts per million moisture. Another trick is working distance, increasing the distance from the nozzle exit to the surface. You start compromising some cleaning, first the hydrocarbon removal, but if that's okay, you still could do particle removal and not cool the surface that much. So it's a, an effective way of trying to reduce this moisture problem. Potential damage, that's something this audience sh should be very worried about. But if you recall that 78 PSI rule, if the material has a yield stress above 78 PSI, we do not expect to see any damage or scratching. If it's lower than that, there's a risk. Uh, if you have a structure, let's say like a needle going up, we'll probably break it. But uh, there was some work done by Kodak about 20 years ago where they had a piece of glass coated with gold. Gold is a very soft material. They cleaned it, they measured its properties, then they cleaned it with CO2 snow, and they measured the reflectivity again. It was the same. Then they measured the surface roughness using an atomic forest microscope, and they actually found it was a little smoother. So at most, on soft material that's properly supported and bound to a surface, there will be a smoothing effect on the atomic and molecular scale, something that cannot be found by optical or electron microscopy. Stack charge exists, ground your sample. Safety, very important. Do not spray yourself. And the key safety issue is really the carbon dioxide buildup in your room. 
So if you're working in a small space, have a CO2 meter and set it for about 0.1.2% CO2 and stop if a buzzer goes off. And that's about it for the cleaning issues. But really the moisture, the surface cooling is the dominant effect. So some equipment. This is uh, top one, upper left. That's our standard unit. It's essentially simple. A CO2 cylinder connector, uh, on-off device. In this case, it's a handgun. This is a valve, solenoid. Uh, there's filters here on these uh, images, but they're not needed for this audience. And then there's the nozzle, and this is a close-up of the solenoid. Down here, this is two solenoids here, and what this is, we call this a dual gas unit. The CO2 enters through this line, goes through this solenoid, and out the nozzle. This line here carries nitrogen and goes into what I call my dual gas nozzle, which is a small polymer structure that has eight ports around the CO2 stream. And you will be talking about using this to clean a polymer-based object. And this is a way of getting around some of the condensation issues. Now, these, no whoops. these nozzles were made for precision cleaning down to the atomic scale. I don't think this audience worries about particles that are 5, 10 nanometers across. So we have a simpler unit, which it has a leak valve. There's a valve for on, off. The leak valve just controls the flow, and we use less expensive nozzles. And in this case, we're able to get just the stream between the high velocity mode and the low velocity mode. And then we're going to have that dual gas nozzle fit over that so someone could pipe in a dry gas around the CO2 stream. And I think this may be more applicable to this audience. But again, the key thing, it's simple. And there are some units out there where they have that nitrogen flow built in directly around the stream, but those things tend to be about three to five times the cost of this. Okay, this is another picture of some equipment. Again, it's a simple handgun, various nozzles, and these are the low velocity nozzles on top. These things produce larger streams, lower velocities. Uh, some of these are one inch across, and this is a two inch across. These are used a lot on telescope cleanings, but I think they could be used for dusting of objects without contact. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's some uh, not, uh, streams. I wanted to show on the top image some different streams. The middle one on top is the, is the adiabatic type nozzle. The top nozzle is a non-adiabatic with a large orifice, and it took all the CO2 from the other nozzles. But you can show you can get streams of good length compared to the standard stream. Now the, one, the nozzle on the bottom, I call that my low velocity nozzle. It's a very small orifice. Generally, it will not remove organics or hydrocarbons unless you're right next to it, like an inch away or less. But there was no CO2 going to that nozzle, so I put an image just to show that it does indeed work. And then the, bo the bottom image is our two inch nozzle, which is, that unit there is going to a telescope in uh, Arizona soon. Okay, next slide. Oh, videos, let's see if we get this to work. Uh, this is a demonstration of the standard unit that was done on a trade show floor. And unfortunately, with the computer here, when it, it's going to get rotated. But that's a silicon wafer three inches across. It's being held on a vacuum chuck to hold it. It's on a hot plate around 35 centigrade. See that dirt on it. And <laughs> yep. this okay. is on a trade show floor. It's cleaned. Very simple. This process is simple. And that's important to emphasize. And just replay it when it cooperates. Yeah, okay. That's it. It is that simple of a process. The key thing is keep your sample warm uh, and make sure it's well supported so it doesn't fly away. Also, you notice how qu relatively quiet that process was. Here's the uh, 
large area stream, and then there's gonna be two videos. This is a one inch one. It's louder. And, and that's uh, essentially, you see the snow in that case. And we did that on a kind of a rug type of substance. Here's that two inch nozzle, which is really aimed for telescopes. Very simple. So in this audience, and I think the next speakers really understand this field better than I do. My experience, avoid old paintings. <laughs> we did a demonstration where we put soot intentionally on old painting, and sure enough, we cleaned it. The guy loved it, and we cleaned it again, and we chipped off a piece. And he said, never go near anything. Acrylic painting, we've cleaned some stuff on acrylic paintings, but there's a paper out of Baltimore area where they show there may have been some potential damage. So test, test, test. Soot removal works. And I'll show that on the next slide. Debris, sculptures, those things will work. And here's an example of soot removal. A kitchen accident from about 25 years ago. Uh, before, it's obvious. After, you see on the lower image, it removed the soot. But if you look carefully, there's still those two inner rings. And generally, the rule I use for soot removal, if it got too hot, you have a problem. And you have to go to other methods, like erasers or other things. So soot removal is something that's very easy with CO2 snow cleaning and quick. That was just two passes. So in conclusion, CO2 snow cleaning works. It does particle removal, hydrocarbon removal, stain removal, and it can work for this audience also. But you have to test and be careful. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Hugh Shockey, who worked, <clears throat> excuse me, in conserv who has worked in conservation for the past 20 years and is currently the new head of conservation for the St. Louis Art Museum. Previously, Hugh worked as an objects conservator here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Lunder Conservation Center, where he carried out a wide range of conservation treatment projects and participated in institutional projects. Hugh served as a member of the Smithsonian's initial response team for the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, which launched recovery efforts after the devastating earthquake of 2010. Hugh holds a Master's of Science degree in art conservation from the University of Delaware. His conservation experience has included large-scale outdoor installations, the conservation of ethnographic and archaeological objects, decorative arts, furniture, traditional sculpture, and time-based media art. Hugh is a Mellon Fellow at the National Museum of the American Indian and has worked in the collections of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and Elvis Presley's Graceland. Hugh served as president of the Washington Conservation Guild, is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation, and has published on innovative treatment techniques. Please welcome Hugh. Thank you, Tierna, um, both for the introduction and for allowing us to have this conference today. Uh, I've long hoped for this time uh, to have a conference on CO2, solid CO2. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in the field. Um, I've seen several presentations over the last few years. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through, um, try and bring it all together and sort of talk about why we're here today give a lot of examples, particularly for solid CO2 for snow, um, but that's not the only type of solid CO2. Um, I really want to be clear that we're talking about solid CO2, not about supercritical, uh, not about just CO2 gas, um, just so that we set the stage. Uh, this is an image from my current collection. I thought I would throw something up that is cold, but is often not so quiet and quite explosive. For those of you who recognize it, this is Mount St. Helens. Um, not a very quiet uh, thing in the early 80s. So moving on. So solid, ice cold, solid CO2, um, variety of formats, but they're all the same. We're all talking about the same material. 
uh, we're, you know, it's a solid CO2, um, whether it's a, as small as you can get it or whether it's a much larger pellet size. I really want to set the foundation for us um, moving into this sort of day of talks where I hope everyone's going to be building on one another. Um, you know, it really is, uh, as a technique, is very similar to other air abrasion. Um, and it, it becomes, as, as I hope you gleaned from Robert's presentation, it really is about applied physics. And, and the, the way you need to be thinking about it really and considering it is with those parameters. Um, it's not a magic thing. You know, you can measure, you can actually calculate um, your force if you need to. Um, depending on the size. We're talking about something that actually is, is really the same hardness. So it doesn't really matter what size it is. Whenever you start having differences in aggressiveness of CO2, it has to do more with the bond energy and other activity, other mechanical activity that you're putting into it, whether it's the force of the gas behind it or the tank pressure that you're using to generate it. Size is critically important. I've seen a number of presentations where uh, the, the application of a particular solid CO2 is not quite right, and often it has to do with the size selection. So are you using snow? Are you using a scraped block? Are you using a pellet? It's really important. Um, you really have to think about the coating, um, soiling, corrosion, whatever you're going to be removing because there are optimal parameters for being able to be successful. If you'll stick to those, you'll be incredibly successful. It can be a very fast technique uh, for what you're using it for. Um, I think for those of you who will be here tomorrow for the demonstrations, you'll begin to learn that there really is a, a user component. So those of us who have used it um, more than just a couple of times can begin to give you some idea of what those parameters are has everything to do with not only being able to select an object that would be successful for cleaning um, or corrosion removal, but also beginning to figure out how you're going to choose what size and really how you're going to set up your cleaning setup on your bench or outdoors. Um, and then there are the safety considerations. Robert touched on those. Um, clearly, as you're getting up into using solid uh, dry ice, uh, much larger, you need to be concerned. But the primary concern is a uh, CO2-rich atmosphere because it's really easy to displace oxygen and we don't operate very well without oxygen. Um, so when you start to feel woozy, it's time to stop uh, if you don't have a meter. So I'm going to talk about snow. And, uh, you know, snow is really what we're, what we're after, um, at least in my consideration. And so that we understand what I'm talking about, I've pulled this lovely SEM image. Uh, this is from Agricultural Research Center up in Beltsville, Maryland, um, so that we really have a good sense. This is the scale that I'm talking about. This is on-demand generation of individual uh, polyhedrons. Um, this is not a rammed up block or a rammed up pellet of those polyhedrons into a solid particle. Talk a little bit about my first experience with solid CO2 cleaning. Um, really interesting, this is in about 2000. All right, I'm a, still a student at Winotour. This comes in as an, uh, an object that is part of my treatment. Um, and Richard Wolbers just happens to have a liquid fed CO2 snow generating unit. I'm curious, I'm wondering if it's going to be applicable. So what I looked at first was, okay, we have a handle, um, we've got a composite object, we have a braided silk cording, we have a ray skin underlay, there are metal components to this, heavily particulate soiling. Um, I start to look at it. So on your right, you see a half cleaned, um, particularly look at the ray skin. And that's really what I focused on. And this is actually after I've already vacuumed and brush cleaned the piece. There's still particulate material down between the silk wrapping. Um, how am I going to get that out? The silk could, has the potential to be damaged. You can see that there were already broken threads. I wrapped it, masked the silk, and was able to go after it with the, the CO2. You can see here this is the, the final sort of cleaning. Much much brighter on the ray skin, the particulate material is gone. This is all dry, there's no moisture brought to the surface, I'm not having to worry about potential effect 
on the silk cording. What I wasn't anticipating was what came next. So the suba of this particular sword had copper corrosion on the surface. It was uh, patinated with a shikudo, so a very thin black patina on this very copper-rich material. Um, I tried traditional mechanical cleaning. All it would do was take the patina off straight down to the, to the copper substrate. It was not effective. However, liquid-generated liquid CO2 snow, I was able to greatly reduce the amount of corrosion on the surface, leave the patina intact, even more so leaving the patina intact. You could see where the wear from the user's hands had been sort of abraded the patina very gently away from the surface. So this was not expected. Again, this was around 2000 whenever I was doing this. I would not really seen any other literature about the potential of removing corrosion from very sensitive patinas. But I was successful after doing a test, having the suba off of the, the handle, doing a test in an area that was not going to be visible. I was sort of very confident that I could do this or could try it without damaging the patina layer. And I was. So what does it take to generate CO2 snow? Uh, Robert gave us a really good introduction. Um, there's some things you have to have. That's you've got to have your source, whether that's a liquid or gas. Um, you've also got to have your nozzle. You're, you're not going to be able to generate it without a, a, a proper nozzle. And then there's optional equipment. Uh, Robert talked a little bit about that. So you can use a dry nitrogen cover gas. This is about sort of controlling your moisture. Um, you can heat the gas, or you can have warmed air. You can also, because we have a static buildup on the surface, anytime you have small particles moving very quickly over a surface, there's the high likelihood you're going to generate a static charge. Um, the unit you'll see upstairs, and I'll talk a little bit here in a moment about it, is sort of a Cadillac version. It actually has an inline um, anti-static generator that generates across the gas stream um, that helps you dissipate the static on the surface. So here we are. This is the, the unit that's upstairs. This is the CO2 tank. This is the nitrogen tank. This long fat hose is a heater hose, so it will heat the gas in line. You get to the white, no or the white unit here. This is the anti-static generator. Here is the nozzle. A little bit closer view. These are the areas of business. That's what the nozzle looked like. All right, looks like upstairs. Mine is a hacked version of Robert's. I changed the orientation slightly from the way he normally uh, sets them up in order to keep it out of the way of objects. Um, so I'm more conscientious of what's going on on the surface. And then here's the anti-static generating chamber. So the nitrogen gas flows through that. You can add an electric charge to it um, and provide yourself with both a heated, dry, and anti-static uh, gas, cover gas. When I first started talking about uh, solid CO2, I really wanted to be clear um, to my colleagues about what are we talking about. And, and really what we're, we want to get at is the primary mechanism is we're dealing with a high velocity, or you can have a low velocity. It's still the low velocity, low velocity for solid CO2 is still quite high uh, in comparison to something like just compressed air. Um, it's a low temperature momentum transfer, and it's a surface cleaning technique. Now, I think we're, we're going to see today some, some examples of where what you're cleaning from the surface could actually be a coating, but in the end, we're talking about surface technique. In the literature, there's a discussion, and I've seen some other talks where people have brought up these topics, of the secondary effects, the sort of micro explosions on the surface from uh, you know, the expansion of solid CO2 as it, as it sublimates into a gas. There's also, you know, whenever you're dealing with a cold uh, technique, you're also talking about temperature depression on the surface, which I think if we all think back to what we know about glass transition temperatures, you can begin to get some of the quote unquote freeze fracture um, effect. Um, I say freeze in air quotes because it really is, you have to think about the temperature. What does it look like? This is the business end of the nozzle that's upstairs. That's really the stream. This is a stream that's generated from a uh, tank's about half used. It doesn't have a lot of back pressure. It's very gentle. It's not very, not very long. A fresh tank will have a different stream. 
Um, it has everything to do with the pressure that's behind the actual gas. This is a gas-generated stream, not a liquid-generated stream. I think Robert showed excellent examples of how liquid-generated stream is going to be much broader, sort of much more intense, a lot more generation on the surface. It also burns through your tank much more rapidly than a gas-fed only system. Thought I would do this illustration for those of you who've seen my presentations before, this will look familiar. One of the advantages that the, the solid CO2 gives us over something like compressed gas, and this would be for a collections care, is you're able to reach beyond that sort of turbulent boundary layer of air that's on everything in our atmosphere. So the more you try and get through that turbulent layer with just air, the more turbulence you create, the less effective you get. So if you are going to dry out the surface, because moisture is your enemy whenever you're using solid CO2, uh, particularly on a micron size scale, you're going to try and dry that surface. You're then going to shoot solid particles through the atmosphere that you're created on the surface, and you're going to be able to displace your particles off of the surface. That's really it. It's a momentum transfer. The secondary effects, if you're counting on those to be the, the cleaning mechanism of choice for your application, you need to back up and rethink why you're choosing a solid CO2 cleaning system uh, for your application. I did a little testing. Um, as Robert said, it, it's excellent for cleaning very hard surfaces. Glass is a lovely hard surface that we use. Here's a microscope slide um, with Sharpie marker on it. I was able to clean this. Um, this is a wonderful image um, from a Hyrox microscope. Um, here what you're seeing is actually what happens on the surface of, of the microscope slide with the Sharpie. You're seeing blast craters. And if you'll notice, here's a debris field on the far side of these craters. That would indicate that the direction that the stream is flowing is from the bottom to the top of this slide. So you get an idea that you really are displacing material. It also should make you think about, well, what are you going to do with that material that's displaced and your deposition that you're going to be leaving afterwards? Look at it a little bit closer. Um, really get a chance to see how clean it can get. So you've got the face of the Sharpie slide, very, very clean glass. You can see here it's all the way down. There's nothing there that's left. Um, whenever you see that difference between that interface. Again, just sort of highlighting and building upon what Robert has, had said earlier. I put these slides in here as, as a way for us all to evaluate, you know, as part of whenever you're choosing a treatment technique, will this work? So you'll notice this slide is bordered with green. This is a thumbs up slide. So if it is a hard surface, again, you see my quotes. Hard is relative, okay? You have to think about is this surface going to be hard enough for the technique to be um, usable on? Um, you also have to think about the momentary surface temperature depression. I put this um, in here as a concern because I've seen a number of presentations where the presenters are throwing out the negative 75 degrees C, uh, which is the sublimation temperature of CO2. Uh, in an effort to try and understand exactly how cold things get in process with CO2 snow, I borrowed an engineer's uh, here at American Arts FLIR unit shot directly at the lens with the snow. You see the black area is impact of snow particles on the, the lens. The low temperature, lowest temperature I was able to get is 46.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 8 degrees Celsius. That's even well above what is a concern temperature um, down around 42, 43 degrees for acrylic paint films. So it's really not that cold. It is below room temperature, and this is done um, at room temperature upstairs in the lab, uh, 70 degree you know, Fahrenheit room. So you get a sense that you need to be sort of skeptical if somebody says, oh, well, it's going to get super cold. Well, how cold is cold? Um, and this was a way to try and really evaluate that. The other thing you have to take into consideration, as Robert noted, is, you know, can it put up with both the force and the turbulence generated by a jet stream? Um, 
It is truly a jet. Um, I did a little measurement um, with an inexpensive weather uh, station. Uh, this is a jet that's generated out of a fresh tank. You can see how thick it is. This is gas only. This is not a liquid generated stream. Um, and the meter, if you can see it, that's 46.9. Well, what are the, the values? That's meters per second. So you get an idea of how fast the, the air is moving. Think about that in terms of how much turbulence it's going to generate on the surface of whatever it is you're going to be cleaning. And if your object is going to be able to withstand that. So unless it's a restrained piece of paper, you're going to be chasing it across the room. Um, if it's an object that's going to be lightweight, you need to think about how are you going to hold it in place. Um, can you use your nitrile covered hand or do you need something more like a suction device to hold it in place? And the last, Robert sort of covered well, particulate, light hydrocarbons. Light hydrocarbons being, you know, very lightweight oils, face grease, fingerprints, those sorts of things. Moving on, you notice this slide has a red border around it. If you're not meeting the parameters of the, the previous slide and you've got things like friable surfaces, could be a problem. Although if you're trying to remove that friable surface, you may have an advantage because it, the solid CO2 has the potential to get under a coating, um, break it up. Again, I had spoke briefly about depressing the glass transition temperature. You may actually get some really good effect from that. Rough surface, rough is a relative term. If you're talking about a micron size snow particle and you're trying to use it on a surface that has millimeter size mountains and valleys, you're probably too rough a surface. If, however, you're talking about a three millimeter pellet, Maybe not so much. Um, heavy oils, grease, those sorts of things, particularly for a snow size unit, you're not really going to be very successful at removing them. You might move them around a little bit just simply by the force of the particles and the jet stream. These are some other variables. I thought I would throw them up there. Again, operator, uh, experience is really critical, not only just understanding what's going to be able to be cleaned, but how close your nozzle needs to be, how far do you need to be, when do you need to take a break, is it going to be a better to use a pulse or a continuous stream um, that can actually affect the quality of your cleaning. You have to control the condensation of moisture on the surface. Now, Robert spoke a little bit about this, and what I would like to say to, to, to my colleagues is think of it in terms of controlling your dew point. So, Often we talk about heating either the gas or the surface. Well, I've discovered that if I pre-chill a surface with the stream, I can actually alter the dew point on the surface and minimize the, the water and condensation on that surface because I've already displaced the moisture in the immediate atmosphere. So think of it as dew point uh, management. Matter of fact, I, I would be interested to do some of the cleaning in a chilled room to see if that has any effect overall to sort of begin to understand what can you do. You need to understand what type of CO2 snow you're going to be choosing. Are you going to be using gas, which is a very small particle size? Or are you going to be using liquid, which is much, much more aggressive cleaning? Um, particles, and despite that you're not supposed to shoot it at yourself, I've tried it. Um, liquid on your fingertip, you will be able to fill the sharp edges of the crystals with air or gas generated. Uh, CO2 snow, you really won't be able to feel anything other than the pressure against your skin. So that gives you an idea of how much difference there can be between the two. You also have to really think about what's going to happen with that material that you're ejecting. You can either have suction device, whether it's a Niederman or other sort of snorkel. Um, I actually find that clean room sticky pads on the far side of wherever you're blasting can be helpful. They'll sort of capture whatever gets ejected from your, your surface and not let it go. They're very sticky. Think sticky traps for pest management. I'm going to run through a couple of examples, and these are really just sort of playful experiments of materials that were these. This particular uh, item is in the Joseph Cornell Study Collection, which is here at American Art. Um, so bound steel spring, um, rather dirty. Um, before, after, this is you know, maybe 30 seconds of time. You don't have to unbind the spring. You're able to get rid of particulate material, uh, material that's going to bring moisture to the surface if you're leaving this in storage for very long. 
So really quick, really effective, meets all the parameters, hard, particulate soiling, maybe some light hydrocarbon, you're there. You know this is going to be a successful clean. Something a little trickier, okay? This also comes into the idea of potentially snow is a, a, a maintenance tool. So this is uh, uh, Rattle by John Pripp. Uh, it's in the collection of the Renwick here. And by and large, most of the objects I'll be showing are in the collection of American Art of the Renwick. This is a treatment that was conducted by uh, Laura Kubik. Uh, it really sort of straightforward um, silver cleaning, calcium carbonate slurry, where you know, those of us who are objects conservators, particularly if you spend any time at Winotour, know all about polishing silver. Um, but it's a really gnarly surface. So you can see that the surface here has an electroformed, um, and I spoke with the artist later, and he's like, oh yeah, we were just you know, playing around and these were happy experiments. This thing is a, kind of a problem for corrosion because it was done in electrolytic baths and platings, so you've got a lot of material there that may not have been rinsed very, very well whenever it was produced. So, Here's a real close-up view. This is at about 50 times magnification. Um, this is after it's been cleaned with a slurry and rinsed just with water. So the white material here down in the interstices, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, if left on the surface, we know will attract moisture, could potentially be a center for corrosion to start. So I asked Laura, hey, go scrub that thing down with soft bristle brush, um, flowing water, let's see what we can get. You can still see there's still calcium carbonate in the interstices. Well, let's, let's hit it with some carbon dioxide snow and see what happens. Still material on the undercuts. Now again, we're dealing with the sort of laws of physics, um, particularly with particulate momentum transfer. If you can't get to it in a line of sight, then you're probably not going to be able to remove it. But I think you'll agree that the rest of the surface, particularly this sort of gnarly surface, is much cleaner than it is in the traditional methods that we would use to follow up after um, a silver cleaning to remove our polishing residues. Uh, it's actually quite effective at removing calcium carbonate from the interstices. I've used this on several other things, um, just as, you know, let's get it cleaned and out because we need to get it on exhibition. Uh, this is another just sort of trinket, if you will, a pin box from the Joseph Cornell Study Collection. It's an embossed and foiled paper box that has the pins stuck in it. I do not know the composition of the pin heads. Um, you can see quite dirty, even on the undercuts. Uh, very obscuring of the embossed surface. In the after, here's the deal. This took about 30 seconds to a minute. I did not have to remove the pins. There was no damage to the surface of the paper box or the foil. Um, you're done. Even cleaned on the underside of the pins if you keep moving things around so that you can get to where you need to clean. Again, Joseph Cornell Study Collection, um, polymer box. Note the little swipe up here, fingernail or whatever it was that's already made its way through the soiling material as it gradually disappears. Um, Nothing else used but CO2 snow. This is gas-generated CO2 snow, okay? So not liquid. Liquid probably would have been much more effective. Polymeric surface. Is this hard? It's not glass, it's not metal, but it's hard enough. It's probably a polycarbonate would be my guess, um, is what this material is. Uh, I'm sure there are a number of you who have seen this presentation, uh, previous presentation where I focus on this particular artwork. Tierna mentioned it earlier. The cellulose acetate butyrate, a rather flexible but hard enough surface to consider for CO2 snow cleaning. Specular light, you begin to see what's going on. There's sort of a, a weird sort of surface haze. If we get even closer, hopefully you can see the, the bubble wrap tracks that are in this haze. So definitely something on the surface disfiguring. This is a high minimalist piece. You know, it really needs to be as pristine as possible. Some of the damage here, uh, scuffs and scrapes, that's not something that CO2 is going to be able to deal with, particularly in a polymeric sense. So Robert spoke about you know, the smoothing of a gold surface. This is gonna be too soft a surface, I think, for that really to happen. 
for, for this type of material. Um, we've got a video here. I've shown this before. This gives you an idea how quick it can be. Um, in this instance, I'm running nitrogen gas, but I'm pre-chilling the surface. I'm starting up high and moving down into the surface. This is actual treatment time. Uh, you can see so far this is continuing to disappear. I am getting to a point in my returns where I'm slightly overwhelming the nitrogen. Okay, I'm beginning to get condensation on the surface. That's something you just have to think about. You know, you may need to, instead of having a continuous stream, do repeated blasts, which can actually be quite effective. Um, it's sort of hit it, reset, hit it again, and you just keep pounding away at it on a very microscopic level until you're ready to move forward to the, to the next sort of cleaning phase. You'll notice I keep going back over the surface. I tend to move in one direction and come back, keep moving in the other direction. It's all about controlling that blast material that you're, that you're sending off the surface. Um, in terms of PPE, there was a question about PPE. Well, depending on what you're cleaning, you're, you probably do need safety glasses and it wouldn't hurt to have an N95 particle mask because if you're generating particles that are airborne and you don't have a good containment system or an extraction system, then they're gonna be airborne. It's like any type of particulate cleaning system that we use. Okay, um, just some details. So the scuff here is in the surface of the actual plastic. That is not something, again, that the solid CO2 is going to be able to remove. Um, in the after, you can see, if we get a little bit closer to the scuff, you can really see the streaking that was the haze over here, not so much, okay? Here's a before and after. I think clearly shows you sort of the degree of cleaning that's gone on. These sort of droplets, the scuffs, all of that remains. It's not something that the solid CO2 snow is gonna be able to remove. Um, Whenever I, you know, Robert said, you know, you have to be able to sort of look at and evaluate a lot of different things to really know what your system's going to be usable for. And I think that's really true. This is something that's been building for me over the years as I've been using solid CO2 and the willingness to put whatever I thought would fit the parameters underneath the nozzle has been very beneficial in sort of my own learning experience about what is possible and what maybe is not. Um, and this is an example. Uh, this sculpture is actually upstairs on view uh, in the contemporary galleries on the third floor. Um, I love this sculpture. Uh, the artist is great. Um, this is a centrifuge cast, if you will, um, polyester resin sculpture. Uh, it's beautiful. It's supposed to be absolutely pristine surface. I think a lot of you know how difficult it is to keep a polymer surface pristine, particularly in a gallery environment. Um, but I, it came in before treatment. Um, in an effort to really make the most of it, I decided, well, let's try. It had fingerprints on it. It was going to be resurfaced anyway. So I'm like, let's see what it'll do. So here's another video. Now, this video was shot at about 100 times magnification. This wonderful modernist painting is actually the surface of uh, the uh, polyester resin with fingerprint. So the white streaks are fingerprint residue. Um, I apologize for the, for the sort of jitteriness of the video, but it is, it, you know, at 100 times a bump is, is like an earthquake. Um, pay very close attention at the very beginning. You'll see the initial blast takes quite a bit of material away, particularly in these areas. You'll also begin to see what we're talking about when we're talking about surface moisture. And at one point during this, I actually cut the nitrogen feed, and all of a sudden you'll see that moisture just really begins to, to aggregate on the surface. So you can see the, the CO2 stream is coming in from this direction. You'll notice that by and large, the, the mass of the moisture that's condensing on the surface is actually on the fingerprint material, not so much on the surface of, of the media. The white that you see come across occasionally is just me dragging a chem wipe across the surface to help with this, the moisture. Um, I'm choking the computer, my apologies. 
You can see some of these streaks over here from you know, beads of moisture that are rolling across. You really can't see the stream. Here, clearly, I've cut the nitrogen out of it. So all of a sudden, you just see this massive amount of moisture on the surface. Again, you can control that even without a nitrogen gas. If you'll pull your nozzle back, control that dew point level, you'll actually see the moisture rise up off the surface and just sort of go back into the atmosphere. Robert said earlier when we were talking before the beginning that you know fingerprints are really hard to get off the surface. I could let this run for the whole two some odd minutes and you would see that I've gotten it completely clean, but um, for the sake of time, let's, let's move forward. Um, gallery maintenance. So Robert talked about uh, the glass piece. This is Banquetcha. Um, open view, 2007 to 2014. It's a long time to be in an open display. The maintenance that I was doing was actually with the CO2 snow. I would go probably every three to six months, dust it down. No substitute for a wet cleaning, but man, it would look great after I was done with the CO2 snow cleaning of the glass overall. In place, no disassembly, uh, really effective. Over here we have exposed wiring in a circuit. Uh, cloud music piece just came off display. Um, it was an open display. I also used the, the CO2 snow, here's the nozzle over here, um, to clean it when it first came in. The artist said that it had never looked cleaner in its lifetime. Uh, which was always always flattering to hear, uh, particularly when they're happy about it. Um, but how are how are you going to how are you going to surface clean all of these very intricate, plugged in to breadboard circuit wires? Are you going to take them out? Well, if you take them out, you change the programming actually of the, of the unit. If you don't put them back in the right spot, I was able to clean this. We'll say in five minutes with CO2 snow. Otherwise, that's a lot of uh, urethane sponges. Uh, vacuuming and brushing. Number of folks to thank who've helped me over the years um, and recently uh, more snow uh, from a collection of uh, St. Louis Art Museum. Um, video, you'll see Robert here as well as a number of other folks. Um, please take down my contact information if you need it because I don't have business cards. I've, I'm my fifth week at St. Louis so um, anyway thank you very much.